Hi, this is Honda the Honda Mackinen. A little while ago I made a video talking about some of my favorite video game composers, and today I'm going to talk about some more of my favorite video game composers. And let's start off with a name that I probably should have mentioned in that previous video. And that is the composer David Wise. Now even if you don't instantly recognize that name, you will instantly recognize his compositions. David Wise used to be one of the main composers for the video game company Rare. And he already started in the company back in their early days, but of course the soundtracks that most people will recognize from David Wise are the ones that he did for the Donkey Kong Country games on the Super Nintendo and the Donkey Kong Country Returns titles later down the line. Which is to say, he did not make the soundtrack for Donkey Kong 64, that, that one was made by another Rareware composer, Robin Beanland, who is most well known for having composed the soundtrack to Conquer's Bad Fur Day, and particularly the great Mighty Pooh song. And no, he didn't just compose it, he also sang it. Now, in my previous video, I mentioned Kochi Kondo, and David Wise, in a way, is kind of the anti-Kochi Kondo in a certain way. Meaning that, whereas Kochi Kondo was able to use very simple melodies, in, but work them in a way that you would never get tired of listening to them. David Wise would always do very intricate and complex compositions with varying stages of progression through the various songs in the Donkey Kong games. And because of that, his songs usually manage to create a very powerful mood when you listen to them. For instance, the first time you go into an underwater level in the first Donkey Kong Country game, it's, it's quite a striking experience. My favorite of the Donkey Kong Country soundtracks is obviously the one from Donkey Kong Country 2, which had a much more gloomy and doomy kind of vibe to it, which is interesting considering that these, that these were platformers meant for children. But yeah, with songs like Stinger Brush Symphony, it's no wonder why people love going back to listening to David Wise's compositions. And I've told this story somewhere before, but Donkey Kong Country 2 was actually the kind of game where I would regularly just pause the game in order to be able to listen to the music because it was so awesome. The next composer I actually did mention in the previous video when I was talking about Michael Z. Land, and that composer is Peter McConnell, who is the other great composer from LucasArts. Now, I already mentioned that Peter McConnell had a bit of had a history of working on the Monkey Island games, and he is a very talented musician, actually playing a number of different instruments. And in fact, when the Secret of Monkey Island Special Edition was being made, he even came back and recorded a new violin solo for the Ghost Ship Shuffle. However, he is best known for his collaboration with Tim Schafer, one of the principal writers for the first two Monkey Island games and he has actually gone on to do the soundtracks for multiple Tim Schafer titles. He is also known for making the soundtracks for the Sly Cooper sequels. But of course, as the absolute surprise of no one, my favorite Peter McConnell soundtrack is of course from Tim Schafer's 1998 adventure game, Grim Fandango. Now, I mentioned previously that Michael Land was into making fairly complex but highly recognizable compositions, whereas Peter McConnell, I think, had always had a slightly better feeling for hooks, and because of this, his soundtracks often are a little bit more memorable because the melody sections are rather well defined. But the other thing that makes Peter McConnell such a great composer is just his versatility and ability to combine different genres, Grim Fandango being the perfect example. Now, due to the game's rather bizarre setting. It uses a mix of 1920s and 30s jazz and big band influences, but also native South American music as well, which all serves to create a very unique sound for that particular game, which I personally really enjoy. And one of my all-time favorite compositions from this soundtrack is the Manny and Meche theme, which I, I kind of consider the unofficial theme song for Grim Fandango. Now with the next composer, once again, you may not instantly recognize the name, unless you're into late 80s and early 90s J-pop. But again, you will definitely recognize the composer for his work. Their name is Masato Nakamura. He, of course, composed the soundtrack for the first two games in the Sonic the Hedgehog series. He's also one of the founders of the band Dreams Come True, and I think his work really speaks for itself. Sonic 1 and 2 have some of the best music, not just on the Mega Drive, but I think from any video game. In Sonic 1's case, I've always been a big fan of Green Hill Zone and Marvel Zone, and my personal favorite, Starlight Zone. But of course, Sonic 2's soundtrack is one of the greatest of all time. I think almost none of the music in the game sounds bad. From the Ocean Zone to the Chemical Plant Zone, 
most of the soundtracks have either very distinct melody sections or just really awesome percussion, which puts you in the right mindset to play a Sonic game. Now, something that has always bothered me a little bit about the Sonic series, if you compare it to, say, something like Mario or Castlevania, and yes, I'm bringing up Castlevania for a reason, is that you might have noticed that in most Sonic games, you don't often hear older music from previous games being recycled, whereas in Mario and Castlevania, that was kind of just a normal thing. I've always been kind of particularly puzzled why the iconic Sonic the Hedgehog theme song from the first two games doesn't appear in practically any of the other games, with one major exception being Sonic Generations, but that was obviously a anniversary title which recycled a lot of music from previous games. Which brings us to the kind of weird tidbit I have about Masato Nakamura, which is the fact that he actually owns the rights to the Sonic the Hedgehog theme song, and not Sega. In fact, this caused a little bit of problems for Sega in the past, when Sonic Spinball was released, explicitly to give Sega a little bit of more time to work on Sonic 3, it originally was going to feature a rendition of that same title song until Sega told Sega Technical Institute to take it out because they would have had to pay Nakamura royalties for using it. Now that's not to say that Nakamura and Sega have a bad relationship, they don't. And the tradition of hiring professional musicians to do the soundtracks for the Sonic franchise is something that has continued to this very day. But I always kind of found it a little bit weird how you almost never get to hear older Sonic tracks in later games. And finally, I wanted to end this video talking about one of my favorite composers from either the Mega Man or the Castlevania series. Both game series are highly beloved for their excellent soundtracks. But as I did a little bit of research, I came to unfortunately discover that literally every single one of the NES Mega Man games, for instance, had a different composer assigned to it. And once we get into the 16-bit titles, almost every single Mega Man game had multiple composers working on it. And in Castlevania's case, they had multiple composers working on each individual game right from the start. However, I was actually able to find one composer who had actually worked on both franchises. And that composer is Kinyu Yamashita. Yamashita actually worked on the soundtrack of the very first Castlevania with Satoe Terashima, who to his credit actually went on to work on the soundtrack of Castlevania 2, which is one of my personal favorites, but he did that work with two other composers. Nevertheless, Yamashita's contribution in the first Castlevania soundtrack shouldn't be underestimated because, as I mentioned, in the Castlevania series it is very n normal for the games to recycle older pieces of music, and especially in the case of the first Castlevania, its soundtrack is one of the best on the NES. And some of the tracks that have gotten reused over the time include Heart of Fire, which is the theme from the Grim Reaper level, the absolutely catchy and rocking Wicked Child, and of course, the greatest level 1 theme of all time, Vampire Killer. Which, incidentally, is also one of the alternate titles for the Castlevania series in Japan. But that's pretty great. So, which Mega Man game did Yamashita go on to make the music for in the future? Well, that, of course, was Mega Man X3 on the Super Nintendo. Now, people already know this about me, but Mega Man X3, while maybe not objectively the best game in the series, is my personal favorite, as I've devoted an entire review video for it, and I mentioned this also when I did a bit of an overview of the X series a couple of years ago. And one of the big reasons I love X3 so much is because of the soundtrack. Now again, the soundtrack of the first X game is pretty damn near flawless, and I would argue it's actually better than the often hailed Mega Man 2 soundtrack, but X3 is the point at which the series firmly stepped into the realm of rock music, and X3 is just filled with incredibly memorable riffs and excellent guitar pieces from music like the Volt Catfish theme, Toxic Seahorse theme, and Gravity Beatles theme, just to name a few. In fact, the only part of the soundtrack that I'm not a huge fan of, I do think that the castle themes are maybe a little bit unmemorable, but that soundtrack also includes my all-time favorite intro-level theme from any Mega Man game. It's just so energetic and gets you pumped up for the game. It is just a fantastic piece of composition. So there you go for more of my favorite video game composers. But tell me, who are some of your favorite video game composers and which games did they make their music for? Leave that in the comments down below. I'm Hunter the Hunter Mackinen. See you on the next one.